all the young dudes. Chapter 1 Summer, 1971 St Edmunds Saturday, the 7th of August, 1971 He woke up in the dark. It was too hot in the little room they'd put him in, being early August. Though, he supposed that could be the fever. He always had a high temperature the morning after. They used to put him in a room with a window, but a few months ago he'd been able to smash one of them, and if it hadn't had bars anyway, then he'd have escaped. He'd heard them talking about restraining him as he got older. He tried not to think about it. He remembered the feeling of hunger, so intense it transformed into rage. He remembered howling and keening for hours, circling the cell over and over again. Perhaps they'd let him off lessons today, and he could sleep. It was the summer holidays anyway, and not fair that he had to do lessons when all the other boys were allowed to spend all day dossing about, playing football or watching telly. Sitting up, he stretched carefully, paying attention to every ache and pop of his joints. There was a fresh claw mark behind his left ear, and a deep bite in his right thigh. He rubbed his hand over his scalp, where his hair was shaved very close to his head, and bristled against his fingers. He hated it, but every boy at the children's home had the same severe buzz cut. It meant that when they were allowed out in town on weekends, everyone knew they were St Edmund's boys, which was probably the point. The shopkeepers knew who to look out for. Not that the boys themselves did anything to subvert expectations. They had been told so often that they were the dregs of society, left behind and unwanted. So, why not cause a little havoc? Remus heard footsteps at the end of the hall. It was Matron. He could smell her hear her heartbeat. His senses were always amplified after one of his episodes. He stood up, pulling a blanket around himself despite the heat, and padded towards the door to listen harder. She was not alone. There was a man with her. He smelled old and somehow different. A thick, iron scent, which reminded Remus vaguely of his father. It was magic. Are you sure it's worth your time? Matron was asking the stranger. He's really one of our worst cases. Oh yes, the old man replied. His voice was rich and warm, like chocolate. We're very sure. Is this where you keep him? During his episodes? The matron finished in her clipped, nasal voice. For his own safety. He started biting since his last birthday. I see. The man replied, sounding thoughtful rather than concerned. May I ask, madam, what is it you know about the young man's affliction? Everything I need to know, Matron replied, coldly. He's been here since he was five, and he's always been trouble. Not just because he's one of your sort, my sort, the man replied, calm and unperturbed. Matron lowered her voice almost to a whisper, but Remus could still hear. 
my brother was one. Haven't seen him in years, of course, but he occasionally asks me favours. St Edmund's is a very special institution. We're equipped for problem cases. Remus heard the jangle of keys. Now, you must let me see him first. He often needs patching up. I don't know why you wanted to see him after a full moon in the first place, if you already knew. The old man did not reply. A matron walked towards Remus's room, her patent leather heels clicking on the stone floor. She knocked on the door three times. Lupin, are you awake? Yeah, he replied pulling his blanket tighter. They took his clothes off him to stop them getting torn. Yes, matron. Matron corrected him, through the door. Yes, matron. Remus muttered, as the key turned in the lock and creaked open. The door was plain wood, and he knew he could easily smash it during an episode but it had been fitted with silver plating after the window incident. Just the smell of it made him feel queasy and headachy. The door opened. Light poured in like water, and he blinked wildly. As Matron entered the room, he automatically took a step back. She was a bird-like, pointy sort of woman, with a long, thin nose and dark, beady eyes. She regarded him warily. Need any bandages, this time? He showed her his wounds. They weren't bleeding anymore. He'd noticed that the injuries he inflicted upon himself, though deep, healed faster than any other cuts and scrapes. He never even needed stitches. The scars never faded, however, and left silvery slash marks across his body. Matron knelt before him, dabbing him with antiseptic and wrapping him in itchy gauze. This done, she handed him his clothes, and he dressed quickly in front of her. You've a visitor, she said, finally, as he pulled his t-shirt over his head. It was grey, like all of their clothes. Who? he asked, looking her in the eye because he knew she didn't like it. A teacher. He's here to talk to you about school. Don't want to, he replied. He hated school. Tell him to get lost. Matron clipped him around the ear. He'd expected it, and didn't flinch. Less of the lip, she snapped. You'll do as you're told, or I'll leave you in here for the rest of the day. Come on, now. She grabbed his arms and pulled him forward. He scowled, thought about fighting her off, but... There was no point. She really might lock him in again. And he was curious about the stranger now. Especially as the scent of magic grew stronger as they moved down the shadowy corridor. The man waiting for them was quite tall and dressed in the strangest suit Remus had ever seen. It was velvet a deep maroon colour, with elaborate gold embroidery at the cuffs and lapels. His tie was midnight blue. He must have been very old indeed. His hair was white as snow, and he had an incredible long beard which must have reached his navel. Strange as he looked, Remus didn't feel intimidated as he did with most grown-ups. The man had kind eyes, and 
smiled at Remus from behind half-moon spectacles as they approached. He extended a hand. Mr. Lupin, the old man said, warmly. A pleasure to meet you. Remus stared, entranced. No one had ever addressed him with such respect before. He felt almost embarrassed. He shook the man's hand, feeling an electric burn as he did so, like battery acid. Hi, he replied, staring. I'm Professor Dumbledore. I wonder if you would join me in a turn about the grounds? It's such a lovely day out. Remus glanced up at Matron, who nodded. This in itself was worth having to talk about school with an oddly dressed stranger. She never let him outside during a full moon, not even with supervision. They carried on down a few more corridors, just the two of them. Remus was sure he'd never seen Dumbledore at St. Edmund's before, but he certainly seemed to know his way around. Once they were finally outside, Remus breathed deeply, the warm summer sunlight washing over him. The grounds, as Dumbledore had called them, were not extensive. A patch of yellowing grass the boys used for football, and a small patio terrace with weeds growing up through the cracks in the crazy paving. How are you feeling? Mr. Lupin, the old man asked. Remus shrugged. He felt the same way he always did afterwards. Sore and restless. Dumbledore didn't snap at him for insolence, merely continued to smile down at him as they walked slowly around the perimeter fence. What do you want? Remus finally asked, kicking a stone out of his way. I suspect you already have some idea, Dumbledore replied. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a brown paper bag. Remus could smell sherbet lemon, and sure enough, Dumbledore offered him a sweet. He took it and sucked. Your magic, he said, plainly. Like my dad. Do you remember your father, Remus? He shrugged again. He didn't very well. All his memory could ever drag up was the shape of a tall, skinny man wearing a long cloak, looming over him, crying. He assumed that that had been the night he was bitten. He remembered that well enough. He was magic, Remus said. He could make stuff happen. Mum was normal. Dumbledore smiled at him, kindly. Is this what your matron has told you? Some of it. Some of it I knew. He's dead, anyway. Topped himself. Dumbledore looked slightly taken aback by this, which pleased Remus. It was a point of pride, having a tragic backstory. He didn't think about his father often, other to consider whether he would have killed himself if Remus hadn't been bitten. He carried on. Mum's not dead, though. Just didn't want me. So I'm here. He looked around. Dumbledore had stopped walking. They were at the furthest edge of the grounds now, by the tall back fence. There was a loose board there which no one knew about. 
Remus could slip through it if he wanted to, or get onto the main road into town. He never really went anywhere in particular, just wandered around, waiting for the police to pick him up and bring him back. It was better than doing nothing. Do you like it here? Dumbledore was asking. Remus snorted. Of course I bloody don't. He side-eyed Dumbledore, but didn't get in trouble for swearing. No, I didn't think so, the old man observed. I hear you're something of a troublemaker. Is that right? Ain't any worse than the others, Remus said. We're troubled boys. Yes. I see. Dumbledore stroked his beard, as if Remus had said something of extreme significance. Got another sweep? Remus held out a hand expectantly. Dumbledore handed him the bag, and he couldn't believe his luck. The old fool was a complete pushover. He chewed the lozenge this time, feeling it crunch like glass between his teeth, sherbet exploding on his tongue like fireworks. I run a school, you know? The same school your father went to. That threw Remus for a loop. He swallowed the sweet and scratched his head. Dumbledore continued. It's a very special sort of school. For wizards. Like me. And like you. Would you like to learn magic, Remus? Remus shook his head, fervently. I'm too thick, he said, firmly. I won't get in. I'm sure that's not true at all. Ask her. Remus jerked his head back towards the tall grey building, where Matron lay in wait. Can't hardly read, even. I'm stupid. Dumbledore looked at him for a very long time. You haven't had a very easy start in life, Mr. Lupin. And I'm sorry about that. I knew your father. Only a little. And I'm sure he wouldn't have wanted... Anyway, I am here to offer you something different, a place among your own kind, perhaps even a way to channel all of this anger you have. Remus stared at him. What difference did it make if he was in one home or another? Matron never gave him sweets, and didn't smell like magic. The kids at Dumbledore's school couldn't be worse than St. Edmund's boys, and if they were, then at least he could hold his own in a fight now. But there was always a but. What about my episodes? he asked, folding his arms. I'm dangerous, you know? Yes, Remus, I know, Dumbledore replied, sadly. He placed a hand on Remus's shoulder, very gently. We'll see what we can come up with. Leave it with me. Remus shook him off and chewed on another sherbet lemon. They walked back to the building in silence, both 
satisfied that they understood each other now. Chapter 2 First Year The Hogwarts Express Remus rubbed his scalp again, then his nose, which kept running. It had been bothering him since dinner the evening before, when another boy had punched him. To be fair, Remus had kicked him first, but the boy, Malcolm White, was fourteen, and twice the size of eleven-year-old Remus. Malcolm had made some crack about Remus going to a special school for backwards kids, and he had to retaliate. He had a black eye now, which he regretted. Everyone at the new school would think he was a yob. But then, he supposed he was a yob. Matron slapped his hand away from his head, and he scowled up at her. They stood in the huge ticket hall at King's Cross, staring at two platform numbers. There was number nine, then number ten. Matron looked at the letter in her hand again. For goodness sake, she muttered. We have to run at the barriers, Remus said. I told you, Don't be ridiculous, Matron said. I'm not running at anything. I'll go, then. Leave me here. Remus had only half believed Dumbledore when he explained how to access Platform 9 and 3 quarters. But then, packages had started arriving for him delivered by owls and containing strange books and weird clothes and all sorts of oddments like quills and parchment. Dumbledore had been unfailingly generous over the past month. He'd presented Remus with a list of things he would need for his new school, and promised to send him as much of it as he could from the second-hand supplies at Hogwarts. Now, Remus was willing to believe almost anything, the old man said. He'd never owned so many possessions before, and was actually glad when Matron had locked everything in her office so it wouldn't get pinched by the other boys. Now, it had all been crammed into a battered old charity shop suitcase, which he had to hold in a very particular way so it didn't fall apart. I'm not leaving you anywhere, Lupin. Just wait there while I find a guard. Matron clipped off towards the ticket office, her big backside wobbling as she went. Remus glanced about furtively, then licked his lips. It might be his only chance. He ran at the barrier at full pelt, squeezing his eyes shut tight as he approached the metal turnstiles. But he didn't hit anything. The atmosphere changed, and he opened his eyes to find himself standing on a completely different platform, surrounded by people. Not people. Wizards. The train itself was huge, gorgeous and old-fashioned. The Hogwarts Express. He clutched his suitcase with both hands biting his lip. There were lots of other children, his own age and older, but they were all with their families, some of them crying as they were hugged and kissed by protective mothers. He felt very small and very alone and thought it best to just hurry up and get on the train. Inside, He couldn't reach the luggage rack to stow away his things. So, he chose an empty carriage and sat the suitcase on the seat beside him. He watched the people on the platform through the window, pressing his forehead against the cold glass. He wondered if they all came from wizard families too. 
he wondered if any of them had episodes like he did. He didn't think so. None of them seemed to have scars. A lot of them were wearing normal clothes, like he was, albeit with fewer holes and patches. But some were wearing long dark robes and tall pointed hats. Lots of other kids had owls or cats carried in baskets. He even saw one girl with a tiny lizard perched on her shoulder. Remus was starting to feel even more nervous. His stomach roiling as he realised that despite everything Dumbledore had said about being among his own kind, he would be just as out of place at Hogwarts as he was everywhere else. Just then, he realised that someone was staring back at him from the platform. It was another boy, his own age. He was tall and slim, but not skinny like Remus. He had dark hair, much longer than any other boy he'd ever seen, curling gracefully to his shoulders. He had fine high cheekbones, a full mouth, and startling blue eyes. Seeing Remus staring, the other boy arched one perfect eyebrow in a gesture that clearly said, And what are you looking at? Remus stuck his tongue under his bottom lip so that his chin bulged, pulling an ugly face. The other boy smirked slightly, then threw up two fingers at him. Remus almost laughed. Serious? What do you think you are doing? Come here at once. A rather severe looking witch with the same angular eyebrows as the boy stepped into view, yanking her son away from the window. The boy rolled his eyes, but obeyed, and they disappeared further up the platform. Remus sat back in the beaten leather seat and sighed. He was getting hungry. He hoped the journey wasn't too long. Matron had packed him two dry cheese and pickle sandwiches and an apple, but he didn't fancy them much. After a few more minutes, the door to his compartment burst open and a girl came rushing in. She ignored Remus, flying to the window, pressing her hands against the glass and waving frantically at her family standing on the platform. She was small and pale, with bright red hair pulled back in a tight plait. Her face was blotchy from crying. She kept waving as the train drew away, and her parents waved back, blowing kisses. A sour-faced girl stood beside them, her arms folded. Once the train had completely left the station, the red-haired girl sat down opposite Remus, sighing deeply. She looked at him, with huge green eyes, glistening with tears. It's so horrid saying goodbye, isn't it? She had a high, middle-class accent. Uh, yeah, I suppose. Remus nodded, self-conscious. He didn't really like girls. St. Eddie's was single sex, and the only contact he had with women was the matron and the school nurse, and they were both mean old bitches. The girl was looking at him curiously. Are you from a muggle family too? My name's Lily. Remus, he replied awkwardly. My dad was a wizard. But I didn't know him. Well, I grew up with muggles. I couldn't believe it when I got my letter. She smiled, warmly, cheering up. But I can't wait to see what it's like. Can you? Remus couldn't think how to answer her. But he didn't have to. The door slid open once more, and a boy poked his head in. He had long black hair, like the boy Remus had pulled faces at, 
but it was poker straight. He had a long nose and wore a deep frown. There you are, Lily. I've been looking ages, he said, giving Remus a dirty look, the sort Remus was quite used to. Sev! Lily jumped out of her seat and threw her arms around the other boy. I'm so glad to see you. He patted her shoulder, shyly, his cheek slightly pink. Come and sit in my carriage. There's plenty of room. Oh, Lily looked back. Can Remus come? He's all by himself. I'm not sure. The other boy, Sev, looked Remus up and down, taking him in piece by piece. The fuggish haircut, the fraying jeans, the worn-out t-shirt, the second-hand suitcase. There might not be that much room. Remus slouched down in his seat, propping his feet up on the bench opposite. Get lost, then. I don't want to go to your stupid carriage. He looked out of the window, purposefully. Lily and the other boy left. Remus let his feet drop back to the floor. He sighed. It was noisy outside his little compartment. He could hear shrieking and laughter and owls hooting and a few younger students still crying. Once again, he found himself locked away from everyone else. He was starting to wonder if that was just his lot in life. Perhaps once he got to this Hogwarts place, they'd force him to sleep in a cell, all by himself too. There was a sudden rap at the door, a short, cheerful tune, and it opened once more. Remus slouched even further down in his seat, as a friendly-faced boy with a mess of dark hair and large round glasses entered, grinning. Hiya. He held out a hand to Remus. First year? Me too. I'm James. He nodded his head back to a short boy who had followed him in. This is Peter. Remus shook James's hand. It felt easy and comfortable. For the first time, the tight coil in his stomach began to unwind. Remus, can we sit here? Everywhere else is full and Peter's getting train sick. I'm not, Peter murmured taking a seat opposite Remus, eyeing him warily. He did look a bit green. He rubbed his hands together in his lap and stared at the floor. Know what house you'll be in? James asked Remus directly. Remus shook his head. He didn't know anything about houses. Was that where they'd be sleeping? What were your parents in? James persisted. Did they go to Hogwarts? Remus nodded, slowly. My dad did. I don't know what house, though. My mum didn't. She was not... a muggle. Peter looked up suddenly. You're a half-blood? Remus shrugged helplessly. Shut up, Pettigrew, James chastised the boy next to him. As if it even matters. Remus was just about to ask what a half-blood was, when the door opened yet again. It was the good-looking boy who'd sworn at him in the station. He glanced about, furtively. None of you are related to me, are you? He drawled. He had the same high, upper-class accent that Peter and James had. 
Remus disliked them all at once, knowing that they'd think he was common, and a half-blood, whatever that was. Don't think so, James replied, grinning. James Potter. He held out a hand again. The other boy shook it, easily. Oh, good. A Potter. Dad told me not to talk to you. He sat down next to Remus, grinning. Sirius Black.